Hello, International Church of Prague. I'm so glad that you've joined with us today. Today's going to be a special day where we continue to look at what it means to be made in the image of God and then to reflect accurately what he is like. And today we need to do that perhaps more than ever. We live in a time of uncertainty. In many ways, that uncertainty surrounds us and descends upon us like a darkness. Here in the Czech Republic, coronavirus is reshaping lives tremendously. The infection rate is incredibly high. The hospitals are near to being overwhelmed. The shops are closed. School children have been out of the classroom more than any other country in Europe. And unfortunately, things do not appear to be getting much better. So tomorrow, the days ahead, is filled with uncertainty. In many ways, it looks dark. So what are we to do? Where do you turn in times of darkness? We turn to the light of God himself. And so I want to encourage us as a congregation to do that together corporately in prayer. Psalm 46 verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. That means he's always there. He's ready to answer our prayers, to come alongside of us. And so I want to encourage us to go together in prayer, to pray especially for those who've been impacted by COVID. Pray for those who are suffering from the virus right now. So would you join with me, would you bow your hearts and your heads, and let's intercede on behalf of those who are in need. So right now, let me just ask you to go before the Father. Dear Lord, we come to you recognizing that in and of ourselves, we are powerless. But you are our refuge and strength. We come before you and ask, Lord, for the needs of those who right now are suffering from the virus. Lord, you are the healer. So we ask and pray that you, our healer, would bring healing into their life. Bring healing physically. Give wisdom to the physicians and the medical team. Lord, also bring healing into their life spiritually. Would you use this circumstance to draw many people to faith in Jesus Christ? Father God, we also want to lift up the medical personnel. And I want to encourage you, as you're praying there at home or as you're gathered in a small group, I want to encourage you to, to pray for the people in the medical field that you know personally. Pray for them by name. Lord, we lift them up. We thank you for the gifts and the abilities that you've given to them. We thank you for the sacrifices that they've been making. Lord, may they sense our appreciation. But Lord, I pray that you would give them strength. Lord, that you would renew them in the inner part of their being. Give them strength physically, emotionally, psychologically, and especially spiritually. Would you sustain them and lift them up? And Lord, for them as well, I pray that this time when many of them are coming to the very end of their own abilities, that they will turn to you. That this uh, time of uncertainty and dealing with the coronavirus, Lord, what the enemy meant for evil, you will use for good. So we lift all these things up to you, expressing our dependence. And Lord, help us to be a people that continually come to you, that intercede for one another, and that seek your help, that come to you as the light that we need in the midst of the darkness. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. The days ahead are uncertain. But when we take time to reflect upon it, we discover that some of the things we are actually certain of are just as frightened as those that we are uncertain of. And darkness is perhaps the best word to define the evil and the brokenness in our world. And in many ways, that darkness seems to be growing. That brings us to our first certainty. It is simply this. We live in a darkened world. It is darkened by sin, by abuse, by oppression. It's darkened by deception and lies. It's darkened by brokenness, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and relationally. 
It's also darkened by disease and especially by death. Sin has brought death into the world and it is a stark reality. In fact, it is a certainty that unless Jesus Christ appears, you and I will die. Unless he comes back during our lifetime, we're going to face death. Approximately 55 million people will die in the next 12 months. That's 152,000 people every single day. 6,340 people every hour. 106 people die every minute. Two people die every second. Those statistics are valid without the threats of what may occur in natural disasters, war, or even our current pandemic. Many of the estimates show that this year we'll see far more people pass away as a result of the virus and the effects that it has on those who especially have other medical conditions. But we are not to fear as followers of Jesus Christ because we need to remember who and what we are. We are souls with an eternal spirit and a temporary body. You see, in Christ Jesus, we've been given eternal life and nothing can harm the real us in Jesus. But to the world around us, things are frightening right now. They're discouraging. They're depressing. For those who trust in God, we have no reason to fear. We have a mighty God who has stepped into the darkness and has given us eternal life through Jesus Christ. So why do we have all this darkness? Why are things the way that they are? Well, the scripture reveals to us that humanity and pride brought spiritual darkness and the evidence that is being displayed in the evil of our world, in the brokenness of our world, is what flows out of human hearts. But our second certainty is more powerful than the first. The first one is that we live in a darkened world. But the second certainty is this. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That's what we read about in 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the darkness around us unless we look to the light of God who is, who was, and who will be. God is light, he is holy, and he is perfect. And, and here's a truth I want you to, to take all the way to your heart, to memorize it, to meditate on it. Remember this, light always overcomes darkness. You can't turn on darkness. You can only extinguish the light. John chapter 3, verse 19 says this, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The truth is, because God is holy, because he is perfect light, none of us can stand on our own before him. He is righteous and his holy wrath would consume us. Our selfish inward nature would much rather hide in the darkness than be exposed to the light of God's truth and holiness. But the beautiful thing is, is that if we turn to him, he gives us light and changes us. Just a couple verses before, the ones I just read, is the most familiar verse in the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Light always overcomes the darkness. Jesus always overcomes the darkness. He's always victorious because he is the light of the world. One day he will return and the brokenness will be mended. The darkness will be turned to light. But until then, Jesus Christ has called you and I to reflect his light, to shine forth into the lives and world around us with the light of faith, hope, 
and love in him. Let's listen to Jesus' words to us about this. Yes. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Jesus calls you and I, his followers, the light of the world. So how are we to shine? Well, just as the moon reflects the light of the sun and shines its light into the darkness, followers of Jesus are to reflect his light into the darkness around us. This is our purpose, church. This is what Jesus has commanded us to do. We are to shine. And that brings us to our fourth certainty. God has made us his light, his followers, to shine his life into the world, into the lives around us. We're commissioned to carry the light of God's truth, of his love, of his holiness, of his judgment, because lives are at stake. Eternity is at stake. We're called to penetrate the darkness of our world because people need to see an accurate reflection of him. We are his plan for sharing the truth, to sharing the hope, the grace, the love of what it means to know him. John 9 verse 5 says this. Jesus says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus came to bring the light, but then he passed that light on to us. And that's what he tells us in Matthew 4. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So there is victory over the darkness, and God has brought us into that victory. There's victory over the brokenness in the world around us. And you and I are designed to shine. If we don't shine, how will things change? How will people find hope? in the midst of the darkness. You see, God has entrusted the good news of what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ to you and to me and every other believer. And remember this, a little light defeats a lot of darkness. Sometimes we, we, we look at a candle and we think, well, that's just not very much light. But the darker it is, the brighter it shines. And if we multiply that so that there is more than one candle, so that every person, every follower of Jesus Christ is shining the light of truth, the light of God's grace, the light of his love into the lives of those around him, it's victorious. So church, are we shining? Are we shining in the way that we're supposed to? Because God's plan is for you and I to push back the darkness. He's not relying on anything else but us. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Do you see that promise? God is going to bring the peoples of the world to those who will shine for him. His plan for us is victory, is to make a difference in the lives of those around us. But we have to shine. If we do, people in Prague, in the Czech Republic, 
people around the world, people that we interact with, will see a true picture of Jesus Christ. So how are we to live as light? Well, first we have to personally trust Jesus as our Savior and our, as our Lord. That's where it begins. We have to have a relationship with Him. Otherwise, we're still in darkness. Secondly, we have to choose to shine as light in the world. And so I want to give you a, a, some instructions based on that word light. L-I-G-H-T. Here's what we're to do. Number one, love motivates us to take action. That's how we shine the light of love. The I is that our identity and our confidence comes from Jesus Christ and not from ourselves or our own power. That's the light of faith. The G is that we're to give grace to others as God has shown grace to you and to me. That's the light of hope that we're to shine into the darkness. And that leads into the H, which means that not only do we give grace to others as God has given grace to us, we help others in practical ways. We serve their needs. And then the T is that we are to tell others what Jesus has done in our life. We're to shine the light of the gospel, the good news, by telling them who Jesus is and what he has done. If we do that, if we follow those five steps, we will be lights in the darkness. So let's start with looking at how we're to reflect the light of love. We looked at this last week in our study on Jesus' command to love our enemies. And here's a truth that relates to that. If there's a deficit in our love for others, even for our enemies, it is a shadow or a deficit in our love for God himself. See, love for others and the freedom to love even those who have hurt us or have threatened us in some way flows from our love from God himself. If you think of it like a cross, horizontal love for people reflects our vertical love for God. The more we love God, the more we'll be able to love others. That's just the way it works. And so if you're having a hard time loving others, the place to begin is to go to the Lord and say, Lord, would you help me learn to love you more? We're to reflect not only the light of God's love, but we're to reflect the light of faith and the light of hope. So let's look at faith. This is the I. We need to find our identity and our confidence in Jesus himself and not in ourselves. He's the one who determines who we see ourselves as and how we have the resource to be able to shine forth his life into the world. Our faith must be authentic. We need to admit our mistakes. We need to be humble and recognize our need. We need to put down the mask of self-righteousness and pride. Remember who we are in Christ. When we do, we'll be humble and we'll be filled with love because we'll begin to love others as Christ loves them. So we remember who we are and we remember whose we are. In ourselves, we're nothing. But in Christ Jesus, you and I have been given the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. And God loves and empowers all of his children, every one of them. So it's don't compare yourself with others either, because that's a misplacement of our identity. Choose to shine for Jesus with the light he has given you, with the person he has made you, in the circumstances, in the skills, in the gifts, in the personality that he has given you. And when we do, others will see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Because you see, it's all about him and not about us. And remember this. In Jesus Christ, you already have absolutely everything you need. The truth is, though, we so often get focused in on the darkness that it's easy to forget what we've been given. Listen to this reminder from God's Word in 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Isn't that amazing? God says that once you trust Christ, you've already been given every resource that we need 
for life and for godliness. It also tells us how we access those resources. It says through the knowledge of Jesus who called us to his glory and excellence. The more we personally know and encounter Jesus, the more we'll be able to recognize what faith is and we'll be able to recognize the power and the resources that God has given us and be able to use them for his purposes. Did you see the contrast as we grow in knowing Jesus? We take on more and more of his divine nature. That's what the scripture says. We become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, we become more conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And that's what changes us. That's what sets us free from sin, from habits, from things that would bring defeat into our life spiritually. It's knowing Jesus Christ. Our victory is sure because light always overcomes the darkness. But we have to remember who we are in Christ and the resources that he has given to us in order for us to shine. So how do we shine forth the light of faith? Well, the next verses go on and tell us, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith must grow. If we remain spiritually stagnant, doubt and fear will creep in like a shadow. These verses urge us towards spiritual disciplines. We are told to supplement our faith by asking God to change us. This is what virtue is. This is what holiness is, becoming more like Him. We ask God to empower us to be holy as He is holy. And how do we do that? Well, verse 4 tells us that God has given us His precious and very great promises. The secret is simply this. We grow in likeness to the Lord by being in His Word and applying His Word to our lives every single day. Without that, we're not going to change. We're going to be fearful, and we're not going to be able to shine as light into the darkness. Let me give you a very simple tool that will help you. If if you've struggled to be in God's Word on a consistent basis, I want to encourage you to use the five Psalms. It's it's an app now. It's something I've used for over 30 years personally about spending time in the Psalms every day. And the app makes it even easier. You can find it on your Android or your Apple store and, and download that. And it'll give you five Psalms each day to help take you into God's Word. And it's an encouraging place to really be able to see who God is and to see especially his promises. When we invest our life in God's word, when we learn his promises and live his love, our faith shines forth as light in the darkness. And so if you struggle with that, that's a great place to begin. Well, the L is that love motivates us to take action. The light of love. The I is the identity and confidence in Christ Jesus, not in our own power. That is the light of faith. G is to give grace to others as God has shown grace to you. That's the light of hope. H is to help others in practical ways. And T is to tell others what Jesus has done in your life, the light of the gospel. Reflecting the light of hope is so important because people are searching right now. The uncertainty that they face causes them to question and to search for something in ways that perhaps they've never searched before. This is our opportunity, church, to be able to share with others who Jesus is, how he's brought hope into our life. We need to show them his goodness, show them his love. And here's the promise from his word. He says this in Psalm 18, for it is you who light my lamp, The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. Here's what that means. It means that in Christ Jesus we cannot fail. He can enable us to do the impossible. And light 
always overcomes the darkness. The question is, will we believe his promises? Will we shine forth with the light of God's hope in Jesus Christ in such a way that others see it? The G is to give grace as God has given grace to us. The light of hope. The H is to help others in practical ways, to serve their need. And the T, the one we want to conclude with, is to tell others what God has done for you. The light of the gospel. Sharing your faith can be scary. We all fear rejection and even persecution. But God has entrusted us with the light of hope, the light of the gospel that people are searching for right now. And we must be prepared to share it with them. The hope and the assurance that we have, they long for. First Peter says it this way. Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That means give him his rightful ownership over your life. And then here's what he challenges us to do. Always, every moment, every day, Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. He gives us qualifiers there to show us how we're to be gracious towards others, how we're to be gentle, how we're to show respect. God empowers us with this incredible gift of internal life that he's given to us and a message of hope that he intends for us to share with others. When we do, we enter into the greatest thing that you and I could ever experience, sharing life with others. When we tell others about the hope that we have in Christ, when we tell them how Jesus took on the brokenness and darkness of this world, and more personally, how he's taken my own brokenness, my own darkness of sin and failure and shame, and how he's transformed that, that's powerful. Your story is powerful. What God has done in your life is a testimony that stands against any argument they may have because it is your story and it is absolutely real. So we need to tell them how Jesus has given us forgiveness, how he's taken our shame and he's made us new, how he took our sin, our failure, and he's nailed it to the cross and made us into a new creation. He's given us joy in the place of fear and sorrow. Our hope is in God, and He is working now in our midst. He's even preparing a place for us with Him, because the hope that we have goes beyond the comforts of this world. Jesus offers eternal and abundant life, both now and forever. So Jesus has commanded all who believe in Him to go and make disciples, teaching them all that he has commanded us. This is to be integrated into every part of our life, our work life, our family life, our recreation. Everything that we do should be pointed towards telling people, sharing with people the hope that we have. In fact, a good way to translate Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, is this. As you are going, make disciples. In other words, as you do everything in your life, Let it be about sharing the hope we have in Christ with others. Be intentional to build relationships, to share with others what God has done in our heart and life. That's how we shine the light. Your life was made to tell the story of Jesus. Your life was made to reflect the goodness and greatness of who he is. That is so amazing. And if you've never done that, if you've never been brave enough to share your faith in Christ with someone else. I want to encourage you that if you'll just trust in the Lord, don't trust in your own ability that you have all the answers, trust in Him, and He will use you in ways far beyond anything you imagined. I'm going to put some ground rules up on the screen that will help us to be able to understand how we're to do this, some things that will guide us along the way. And then I'm also going to put up some information just for you and for me. If you don't know kind of what the process is of how a person comes to faith in in Jesus, I'm going to share some answers about that from a presentation called Why. But here's the most important thing. It's not about the rules that we follow, and it's not about a plan. 
We're sharing about a relationship that we have personally with Jesus Christ. That's the place to begin, to share your story, what God has done in your life, how he's taken you from one place and transformed you into a brand new person in him. When you share that, you'll begin to make an impact on their heart and life. Make sure you do it in the context of a relationship, though, and, and do it in the context of listening to them. People need to know that we're genuinely interested in them and not just in talking about ourselves. We'll give you some ground rules that'll help you share, but the challenge is simply this. Will you let your light shine? Because the truth is, even a little light overcomes the darkness. Light always overcomes the darkness. So what is the gospel? Well, the short answer is the gospel is Jesus Christ. He is the good news. We are telling other people about who Jesus is and what he has done. It's about a relationship with him. Here's a summary of our human design and need, what God has done and how we are to respond. In order to be able to put this into a, a, a simple form, I use the letters to the word Y, W-H-Y. The W, we were created in God's image to share his life and show his greatness. But our selfishness and sin forfeited that purpose, separating us from God and brought death. God created each of us with a purpose. He has a plan for your life that includes knowing him in a personal way. The Bible tells us, and history has certainly proven, that all of us are sinners. And because of our sin, we're separated from God. And no matter how hard we try, we cannot bridge that gap on our own. Not through good works, not through church membership, not through simply growing up in a Christian home. None of these things qualify us for a relationship with God or to enter his heaven. We are separated from God because of our sin. That's the W. But the H is the good news. It stands for He. It stands for Jesus. He chose to offer His life to us through Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection, offering us forgiveness of sin and abundant life now and forever. God Himself had to pay the price for our redemption. He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for your sin and for mine so that we could be right with God. God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. That's Romans 5, verses 8 and 10. Then there's the why. It stands for you. You can choose life over death by turning from your sin trusting Jesus as your Savior and confessing Him as the source and Lord of your new life. The promise of the Scripture is, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. The W, we forfeited God's life and God's purpose through our sin. The H, He restores His life to us through Jesus Christ. The Y, you must choose between your own death and your own sin or the life that Jesus offers. The question is, what will you choose? Choose to give him control over your life, over your relationships, over all that you are. If we do those things, the promise is that we will be born again into a new life relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the gospel that all of us who are followers of Jesus are called to share. That's the hope that people are looking for in the midst of the darkness. Here's some ground rules for sharing Jesus with others. First of all, be in prayer. Pray for God to open a door of conversation at just the right time. Secondly, follow up your prayer with belief. Believe that God will open that door and that he will use you to share Christ with others. Thirdly, pray for the person regularly. Look for needs in their life that they have that you can both pray for and possibly that God may use you as an instrument to meet those needs. Be relational. 
we are sharing a relationship with a person, with Jesus himself. It's not a religious idea or ideology. Next, rest in the power and work of the Holy Spirit. You can read through John chapter 16 for more information on this. But the Holy Spirit is the one that draws people to faith in Christ. But he chooses to use us as his instrument. Make a commitment to love the person whether or not they ever come to know Christ. Remember, they are a person. We are to respect them and treat them with gentleness. They're not a project. Similarly, listen first. People need to know you're interested in them and not just interested in talking about yourself and your own experience. In the same way, it's more important to form a relationship than to get through a presentation of the gospel in one setting. It will take oftentimes many conversations before they're ready to hear how God offers salvation to them in Christ Jesus. Also, don't try to change their views about issues or politics. A faith relationship with Jesus is a journey. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings change in our lives. Do not allow fear to keep you from entering into spiritual conversations or from asking the person if they would like to know Jesus personally. Be intentional. These are divine appointments. So look for opportunities where you can share Christ because there is no greater joy than partnering with the Holy Spirit in God's work in the life of another person coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So church, here's our challenge. Will you join with me? Will you join with others within our congregation? And will we be intentional during this season to go the extra mile of showing and sharing what God has done in our life? To be intentional about praying for others and looking for opportunities to share with them what Jesus Christ has done. If you have questions about that, if there's ways that, that Becky and I can come alongside of you and encourage you, would you um, just send us an email? We would love to walk alongside of you and help you discover the joy of sharing what Christ has done in your life with others. The world is filled with darkness, but there is a great and glorious light. His name is Jesus. And right now, he's inviting you and I to reflect Him in such a way that others can see an accurate picture of who He is and find life and hope in Him.